Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Jordan with Fit Happy Free and What Joe Read. Wine Wednesdays are back and with a new theme. Uh, if you know me, you know that I love books. I love reading books and I love to talk about books. So I am going to be using my Wine Wednesdays to read it and whine about it. First off, I will pour the wine. The wine that I am drinking is, I got this because it was on the end cap at HEB. It, this is a gnarly head. Um, I, look at the little skeletons on the top of the label. I thought it was really cute. And this is the Grateful Dead Limited Edition. This is a, a cab salve from California 2020. Uh, I've never had gnarly head before, so um, I'm kind of excited to just give it a try. I have got a nice spooky glass. I'm gonna pour the wine and I'll give it a little taste. Let y'all know what I think and then we'll get on with the rest of the video. Smells good. Smells like it's gonna be bitter. Very fruit. That's really good. Okay, I really like that. Um, if you've had Narrowly Head before, I have not had Narrowly Head before. Okay, this is the Grateful Dead edition. So, yeah, it talks about the band on the back, Grateful Dead. Um, but I got it because, you know, it seems, like, appropriate for spooky season. Um, it's very fruit forward. Um, more on the dry side. Uh, it's got a little bit of a little sweet aftertaste. It's, um, it's good. It's got a little bit of a bite to it, but I like it. Good choice. Cheers. Being as it is October and it is spooky season, my personal favorite, um, I absolutely love horror. I love watching horror. I love uh, reading horror. Um, so I thought today's video, I would do the five books that creeped me out. So starting right off with a classic, Salem's Lot by Stephen King. So before vampires were these beautiful, brooding, misunderstood creatures that are lusted after by teenage girls everywhere, they were these monsters and these ruthless predators and King really uses this evil to add to the terror and attention in his second novel. So this was the second book that he wrote. So. Jerusalem Slot is your typical, small, quaint, pastoral town. Um, it's kind of become a ghost town over the years. And it's also home to the Marston House, which is this creepy old uh, man abandoned old mansion, which is has these rumors around it that, you know, there's been some kind of like unspeakable horrors in it. And um, our main guy, uh, ben Mears, he's our main character. He has returned to the lot after, I think it's 25 years. Um, it's been a long time since he's been there. Um, he had uh, kind of an, a, a bad experience at that house when he was younger, but he's returned to Salem's lot because he wants to write about his experience and kind of get some inspiration and uh, hopefully stay at the house. But when he returns, he finds that somebody has bought the house. Now who would want to stay in a creepy old house like that? So Stephen King, he's he's really good at writing really well-developed characters and a suspense, suspenseful story. Um, I remember watching the 1979 movie when I was a kid and I had to sleep in my parents' bedroom that night because I kept imagining Danny Glick and that scene where he's floating outside the window trying to get in. So um, it was a good spooky read. Um, one, of, one of my favorites by Stephen King, his earlier um, gothic novels, um, I really liked it. So that's number one. These are in no particular order also. So number two is And the Trees Crept In by Don Kurtigich. I think that's how you pronounce it. And the Trees Crept In is a book that really 
Geneva creeps. It really creeps me out. Um, so the story is about two sisters, Scylla and Nori. Nori is the younger sister and she's a mute. And they have come to stay with their aunt Cap at her manor house, which has been in the family for generations. And right away we can tell that the house, there's something not right about it and it's, it must be cursed or something. And this, the atmosphere is of this book, it's just, it's really claustrophobic and it's just, the house is making noises and Kat starts to go insane and a boy appears out of nowhere and then there's the creeper man, who this, this man with no eyes that is in the woods that they're not supposed to talk to and but only Nori can hear him and all the while the woods just seem to start getting closer and closer and closer to the house. So when you're reading it there's, there's definitely like a sense of hysteria and panic while like they're, the girls start to go hungry and the, there's that the ant starts to go into madness and you're just trying to read it and try to make sense of the madness and I will say that it starts to get a little bit weird before it starts to make sense and the revelation at the end um, but it does make sense at the end. I listened to the audiobook version of this which really added to the creepiness factor because um, there were some sound effects and some spooky music to go along with the audiobook and it just it, it really added to the creepiness factor so I would I would definitely recommend the audiobook version but I do hear that the written version also is kind of spooky too because there's some like different like writing and like bold and different fonts and stuff Next book is Kill Creek by Scott Thomas. Kill Creek is my most recently finished book and it's probably one of my favorite like haunted house reads. Um, so the story is about four modern horror authors who have been invited to spend Halloween night in one of the most um, infamous haunted houses in the country to take part of this live interview that is going to become this publicity stunt to kind of heighten interest in the authors. Um, so kind of seems like a standard trope, you know, people invited to spend a night in a haunted house, but there's, there, I, I really liked the way that it was written. And also not a whole lot happens while they're in the house. The rear horror happens when they leave the house. <laughs> I'm not going to really say much more after that. Um, but I will say that I, I really loved the mystery of the house and its morbid past. Um, I liked how the characters were written. Um, they were very well developed and um, just how they just slowly start to unravel after the events of the house and um, how the author, the author really preys on the fears of the characters. Uh, this was actually Scott Thomas's first novel, um, but it was, I, I thought it was a very enjoyable read and it was, it was different and I just really enjoyed like this kind of evil that follows the characters. It's very spooky. Next book is The Last House on Needless Street by Katrina Ward. So this is not your typical horror novel and it's kind of more akin to like a, a gothic psychological thriller. Uh, there's so many layers to this book. Uh, so there's there's several narrators. <laughs> um, there's Ted, who is a strange, reclusive man who's an alcoholic, and his mind not might his mind may not all be all there. <laughs> um, his daughter Lauren, who comes to visit him periodically, uh, Dee, who moves into the neighborhood next door, and she lost her little sister 11 years ago, and she is convinced that Ted had something to do with it. And there's also Olivia, Ted's Bible reciting cat. Yep, you heard me right. One of the narrators is a cat who recites the Bible. <laughs> it's hard to say kind of what exactly goes on between all these narrators and in the walls of, the, of Ted's dilapidated house. Um, it's just, it's really just kind of interesting the, the way that, you know, the, the narration goes between the cat and between Ted and between um, the girl and Dee and figuring out like what's really going on. Um, but it's very clear that not all is well on The Last House on Needless Street. Um, so the back cover of the UK version kind of sums it up. Uh, it says, 
This is the story of a murderer, a stolen child, revenge. This is the story of Ted, who lives with his daughter Lauren and his cat Olivia in an ordinary house at the end of an ordinary street. All of these things are true, and yet some of them are lies. That doesn't make sense. I think that sums it up pretty well. So the reading experience was a bit unsettling and it just really added to the creepiness of the book and uh, some, some will love it, some will hate it, but I just really found it really fascinating. And I think I'm gonna need a refill after this last sip because this next book is gonna need a, another breath before I tell you about it. Okay, <laughs> so last but definitely not least, House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danieluski. So House of Leaves is one of those books that kind of has a cult following and people either love it or they hate it. Um, I am the former. I mean, right off the bat, you open the page and the first page says, this is not for you. It was for me though, I like it. <laughs> um, so I'll try to kind of sum it up the best I can, but it's kind of impossible to sum up this book. Um, so this book is about a house, <laughs> go figure. Um, so apparently this, family moves into this house and they find a, a door that appears and there's a hallway, a mysterious hallway in this door um, that shouldn't be in the house because when you look outside the house, there's just a wall. So the house is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. The owners of the house begin to investigate this phenomenon with their friends and they film the investigations, which are compiled into like a series of short films called the Navison Record. Um, and these films kind of garner a cult viewing. Now this blind man named Zampano, he attempts to kind of assess the verity of the Navison Record. Uh, so he's putting together this big magnum opus and with all this research and all of this, uh, all, all of this stuff, um, but he dies before completing the work and his neighbor finds it and he, his neighbor gets uh, his friend, Johnny Truant, who is a tattoo artist, um, to look at it. And Johnny Truant becomes kind of obsessed with piecing together and or and putting everything in order because it's all, all in these pieces and everything. Um, the work of Zampano's life, which he finds is may not even be real. Uh, I mean, he was a blind man and he was doing this big magnus opus about these films. So, <laughs> I mean, and he starts to have a mental breakdown, like trying to figure out like what's real and what's not. And it's, it's really, and, it, and it's also unclear if Johnny Truant was the final person to put the pieces of the story together before it found its way to these ano anonymous uh, editors um, that put it into circulation. And it's kind of like a book within a film within a book. It's total book inception. So this is a book that you really can't get in audiobook or ebook format because of the way that it's written. I mean, you've got like all these sentences that are crossed out and um, you might be grabbing a mirror to look at some different passages or you may be turning the book upside down at some points because, you know, the, there's different passages that are upside down. And then it just starts getting even weirder. Let's see. Weirder and weirder. And more scattered. And even weirder. <laughs> and that's kind of why people either love it or hate it. Um, so there are footnotes and footnotes within the footnotes and um there's even a facebook group dedicated to this book uh just kind of for, with people that are you know kind of interpreting different passages and kind of giving a kind of how advice on how exactly to read it because 
you know, some footnotes may be important, some might not, and like, it, it's just, it can be kind of confusing to some people. I personally thought that the way that it was written added to the kind of unsettling feeling of the book and how it just seems like a, the um, Johnny Truant was falling apart and just how everything just kind of felt very off and, un and off-putting. Um, so this took, this book did take me a lot longer to read because I did have to take some breaks and I, I found the story kind of haunting. Um, I feel that, and I do feel like the way that it was written just really added to the ambiance of the whole feeling and the atmosphere of it. So, I mean, overall House of Leaves is just, it's such a labyrinth uh, of, and there's like so many codes and symbols that are hidden within the book. And it's, it, it, it's, it's a story that stayed with me that I'll probably try to read again a few times because, uh, I mean, there's always something different that you can pick up with each read. Where's my wine? That's better. <laughs> So those were my five books that gave me some of the creeps. Um, it's a little bit hard to scare me because I just grew up watching horror and just loving horror. So, um, you know, I feel like I've kind of read and seen it all. Um, but if you have any recommendations, definitely leave some in the comments. Um, I've, I've, I've gotten a few on Facebook and there's, I have some that I want to read, but I just, I love, I, I love spooky season. I, I just, I just love reading horror books and it's just, something about it. I mean, especially in October. Like, I will only read scary books in October pretty much because I just love it so much. And I love everything about Halloween, obviously. So, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think and if you have read any of these books. And I look forward to doing more of these in the future. Thank you for being here and I will see you next time. Bye.